very welcome. I'd like to welcome you to the panel and uh, over to you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Hubert. Uh, and uh, I'm very glad that I have the opportunity to give a presentation about uh, our work. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Waterland AI and, of course, uh, Johan and Philly for very kindly invitation. Uh, just to start the presentation to share screen. So <clears throat> I will talk uh, uh, about uh, uh, recent uh, research, what we are doing uh, here in, in, in Kragujevac. Uh, so, uh, of course, COVID-19 is a very hot topic these days, and we are aware about very important uh, how to uh, use uh, any kind of technology uh, in order to make some kind of uh, prediction or just to help uh, medical doctors in this very difficult, uh, very difficult time. Uh, so basically, uh, my presentation uh, will uh, be split two parts. Uh, one part is uh, for specific patient modeling and uh, prediction using AI and, uh, and modeling. And the second is uh, more uh, uh, spreader, uh, uh, actually epidemiological model uh, for the population in Samaria. Uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, uh, we have very long tradition collaboration medical doctors in my lab uh, for many disease, uh, mostly cardiovascular disease, cancer disease, etc. But uh, from January, February this year, uh, uh, all, almost all our activation uh, are going to COVID-19 in order to try to make uh, some kind of, first of all, protection, then uh, prediction, and then some kind of uh, helping uh, to find uh, any kind of, uh, of cure or any kind of uh, therapy for COVID-19. Uh, so, why AI? Because, uh, uh, of course, uh, we, we would like to use the power of AI in order to, uh, to help uh, everyday clinical practice, to help uh, to predict for the patient. For example, it's very important to see uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, you're infected to COVID-19, how your body will behave for next seven days, next important because uh, uh, everybody actually wants to know will they uh, uh, will they need a, a mechanical or what kind of uh, airway will uh, will be inside the, the uh, during the disease and how hard it will be. So uh, we are still, of course, in in pandemic time, and of course uh, we have uh, uh, to be careful about collection of the data. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I, I have to say that uh, these data are very important because we have to collect not just imaging uh, from X-ray or CT, uh, we have to collect all biomarkers and uh, all, all the data which are uh, very important to make this kind of AI algorithm. And of course, uh, uh, I will show you a uh, very, very good simulation uh, was going on, really going on when the, our lungs are starting infection. And we have some solution for mechanical ventilator, how to use it uh, uh, in order to, uh, to slow the spreading of the disease, which is very important. And of course, uh, try, try, try to make uh, drug release inside the, inside the, the lungs. So uh, you can see uh, that, uh, of course, uh, uh, first of all, uh, it's very important to detect the features of the coronavirus, COVID-19, and uh, almost all the patients has uh, very uh, uh, heavy respiratory uh, the symptoms, which are uh, including pneumonia. Uh, so our research for specific patients are concentrated uh, in, uh, in this direction. Uh, actually, we have collected uh, uh, 20, uh, for the moment uh, 21 patients full uh, diagnosis with COVID-19. Uh, I'm talking about the heavy, very heavy patients, of course, who are in the hospital who had the mechanical ventilator. And uh, uh, we have uh, almost every day screening, so X-ray, uh, CT. On these patients, we have every day collection of the data of blood, from blood analysis, uh, uh, measure 
requirements of uh, saturation, oxygen, and uh, everything what is uh, important. And these data, of course, are monitoring uh, through the time. And uh, uh, we uh, have to be very uh, careful about, uh, of course, uh, anonymization of the data because it's, it's uh, uh, live patients. And of course, uh, these patients uh, uh, has to be analyzed uh, uh, until the end, of course, of the, of the therapy. Uh, what kind of data are there actually? Uh, so it is uh, uh, demographics data, so gender, age, number of risk contacts, clinical image data from uh, uh, X-ray and CT scan. CT scan is uh, more uh, more detailed. Uh, we collect temperature, uh, so chest pain, muscle pain, headache, tiredness, uh, sore throat, loss of taste or smell. Physical examination, so uh, breathing, how is breathing, how is uh, sound of the breathing, uh, whistling. And of course, uh, the big analysis of blood tests, uh, red blood cells, uh, uh, PDV, PDW, PLT, PT, GLOBE, etc. So uh, this is very important uh, in order to uh, try to collect what kind of feature are inside the, the uh, we, we can use uh, as dominant uh, for this kind of the patients. And of course, uh, we have to concentrate uh, of uh, everything what is uh, uh, patient's history in order to see uh, some kind of uh, demographics, but also genetic, uh, genetic data. So we started with uh, first non-supervised ML uh, machine learning methods uh, as a starting point, and we know uh, prior knowledge of the patient's outcome. So we have uh, uh, clustering uh, with uh, elbow method and mean shift clustering. So you can see elbow method for optimal number cluster and uh, mean sheet uh, clusterization. Then we use supervised machine learning methods, uh, problem diagnosis patients uh, risk category in the five class uh, with, uh, of course, uh, multi-classification problem with Cummins feature selection and random forex uh, classification. So you can see uh, the red dots uh, in the real values and predicted, uh, predicted values. And uh, uh, this is uh, analyzed uh, for the supervised uh, method. Regarding uh, image processing, uh, so we use uh, UNET uh, CNN to perform segmentation of the lungs with pneumonia and X-ray uh, during the during the uh, they're uh, staying in the hospital, so they are doing almost uh, every day uh, this X-ray and uh, of course uh, CT, which is uh, uh, how to say the uh, more detailed and we can detect uh, more detailed pneumonia even in 14 different classification uh, for, each, uh, for each image. Uh, so for example, we were very, uh, how to say, uh, uh, each patient has completely different uh, symptoms, completely different uh, history in, the, in developing of disease. And uh, for example, uh, there are some patients where the development of disease was almost uh, in several hours, some are in several days. Uh, uh, so it's, it's very, very, uh, very uh, different. Even they have very similar char characteristics, uh, demographic, uh, physical and the blood test. So the point is uh, how, to, how to use this uh, formulation in order to make particularly patients and to use AI in order to predict the behavior of the patients. So for the moment, uh, we, we have uh, one project with also Croatia uh, from Rijeka and Zagreb. Uh, we collect 100 patients and also from Belgrade, we are expected uh, also uh, more than 100 patients full anonymized uh, with imaging and uh, blood marker and etc. And uh, we think uh, 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 of course, uh, increasing number of patients will increase the accuracy of our model and, of course, detect uh, more, more precisely this uh, uh, behavior of the disease. Next is uh, uh, a very specific model uh, for the uh, spreading of the disease, spreading of the COVID-19. And this is just some uh, uh, explanation of respiratory system and uh, how its behavior inside. So, 
Of course, we have to, uh, to understand the anatomy of the patients, to understand the real uh, anatomy parts and uh, the particular molecular level for uh, LE2 or how the COVID-19 attack the, actually uh, and spreading inside the alveola, inside the small part where they can, uh, uh, they can go inside the blood and uh, inside the other parts of, uh, of uh, organism. And uh, this is uh, uh, our model for one of the patients particularly. So we can see uh, upper airways and we can see uh, lung mesh uh, for all lobes. So all lobes uh, during the breathing is uh, actually, they have different behavior. We have five lobes and each lobe has completely different behavior in order to make, uh, to make uh, uh, breathing. So, uh, on these pictures, left and right, you can see simulation of spreading of COVID-19 uh, virus after five days for one particular patient and 10 days after five, after 10 days of infection starting. So red, these red, uh, red objects actually si simulate virus spreading inside the lobe. So you can see after uh, five days, after 10 days, you can see the, how it's growing and how it's big inside infection parts of alveol of the uh, lobes. So after this infection, of course, uh, patient needs mechanical ventilator and it's very difficult to him to, 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 to breathe in. The next is, uh, uh, is a CT finding. So in CT uh, uh, imaging, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can see, uh, do you hear me? Uh, we can we can see uh, uh, CT findings and also uh, some kind of uh, 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 hello. Yeah, some I kind of. You. Do you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Okay, yeah. sorry, I I, I thought uh, you, you lost me. Uh, no. So it's a uh, uh, spreading of the virus and CT findings. So you can see, or this is original imaging. You can see this uh, GGO. Uh, this small white uh, area inside the lungs, and this is simulation here. And uh, uh, just uh, uh, to show you animation, how it's spreading. So during the uh, during the breathing, we can see how the particularly during in airway are going uh, up and down, and how they're spreading across the, the the lobes across the lung airway. So our idea is to. Uh, make specific uh, uh, mechanical ventilator frequency and change the uh, some parameters in order to slowly the spreading of virus because virus is actually spreading because we are breathing. That's the point. So uh, uh, breathing uh, equally in in both uh, both uh, lobes. So if we can uh, make this a little bit different, we can uh, much more slow this process and spreading of the of the virus. So this is very interesting. We publish uh, in high in very peer review journal this work, and we are very exciting uh, about this how how it can be done. The next is of course epidemiological models uh, for the some particular area. This is very important, of course, uh, uh, for community in order to understand what will what will happen in our town, in our area, and of course in 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 one country. So understanding of this epidemiological model is very important. So we use a seared model uh, where we have susceptible exposed infected, uh, one infected, two infected, three. Uh, infected one is mild one, uh, infected uh, two is severe, infected three is critical. And we have of course two part recovered, fully recovered and dead, uh, dead, dead the patients. Uh, so Inside the model are, of course, some equations where we have susceptible individuals who are infected begin as exposed community and where they are asymptomatic and do not spread infection and recover person, patient, persons who are monitoring by air class and supposed to be safe from reinfection for life. And individuals with critical infection recover at the rate gamma 3 and die at the rate uh, me. The rate of development uh, of the exposed stage uh, to the infective stage uh, I, uh, patients become symptomatic and contagious occur in the pace A and infected individuals begin with mild infection starting with either recover or the rate gamma one or advanced to severe infection I2. 
at the rate P1. So severe infection subjects recover the rate gamma 2 or progressive critical, critical stage. So just examples from Serbia, we have average fraction symptoms infection, uh, which are MIL 71%, Croatia 86, for example, Belgium 79, and we have different percentage as you can see here. So when we compare it with official data, uh, which are coming uh, uh, from the uh, public health institution. So, for example, we have very good, uh, uh, in Belgium, very good uh, uh, prediction uh, for uh, all the parameters, respectable, exposed, uh, mil severe, critical, recovered, and dead. Uh, see, here is a uh, uh, number of people with critical infection, mild infection, and uh, of course, uh, severe infection, and uh, fortunately, dead people. Uh, so you can see that uh, this model can predict in one area very precisely what's going on in order to how it's spreading and how it, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, going, uh, uh, going on on the, on the patients, on the, on the population. Uh, this is data for Serbia, also for the, all the uh, parameters uh, uh, with the uh, mild infection, severe critical infection and the number of dead people. And uh, this is uh, for Croatia. So we analyze uh, the best results are for these three, three countries. And uh, you can see a uh, number of people with mild infection, severe, critical, and, uh, and uh, dead people. So for conclusion, for these two parts of the model, uh, we use AI to make patient-specific prediction and finite element simulation to make prediction of the spreading of the COVID inside the lung when, when they're already there and how to avoid the spreading, quickly spreading during the days, during the hours. Uh, another part is very important. If you have some data on some small area, some town or some countries, uh, we can make epidemiological model and uh, th this is uh, uh, also important in order to understand how the, the COVID-19 will spread and, of course, how many people will infect and, and will die, unfortunately. Uh, if we go, up, if we uh, do a personalized model, uh, I think uh, we need much more data to be, so accuracy to be much more uh, uh, higher. And, of course, in order to better understand disease, uh, future research, of course, uh, we have to include uh, for epidemiological model uh, more phenomena, uh, especially how medical intervention and asymptomatic infection, because that's very important to understand this because the number of asymptomatic persons is much higher, in order to better describe the spread and, and development of COVID-19 and try to, to better understand this process and, of course, to uh, uh, to stop uh, or try to, to reduce the number of infection people and number of uh, number of uh, uh, number of died people. So that that's uh, all for, from my talk and thank you very much for your attention. This is just some uh, uh, acknowledgement for uh, this funding. So we got some European projects for this and also some national projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dinat. Fascinating talk and very detailed animation also. Um, I've got a couple of questions, um, if that's okay. And um, again, thank you very much for a very detailed and uh, enriching conversation here as well. Uh, we have a question. Will AI ever be able to replace doctors completely? As far as we know so far, AI is used as a, an additional tool, but the final decision may be made by a human. Do you consider that to be the case forever, or do you imagine a scenario where uh, a decision could be made by AI? Uh, okay, so for sure AI will help very much. Uh, even today, it's helping uh, very much uh, for this process. Uh, but I'm not completely sure when we can uh, just say, okay, that's all. So we can use just AI without human. I don't believe in this. Okay. Another question is uh, a comment first that there's a great difference between predictions and public data for Serbia in one of the slides. 
Mm -hmm. Earlier, there was a great discussion about the accuracy of public data. And is it possible a reason for this being a different? Uh, well, I think yes. I think yes. Because, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you, you observe very well. For Serbia, uh, there was not so much, uh, uh, how to say, uh, fitting. Uh, well, uh, I think, uh, you know, there is a, a lot of problem in collected data. Uh, uh, of course, it's, there, there are a lot of human errors, first of all. Then uh, we have a lot of data, a lot of uh, uh, empty parts of the data. So for AI, of course, we have to use some kind of augmented, uh, you know, feeling uh, with this data interpolation or, or this kind of this. But before we do this, of course, we have to consult with uh, medical doctors because I'm an engineer, I cannot, I don't understand what is, you know, uh, LDL, HDL, or what is influence, how I can fill this data. So it's very important to have experts in medical science uh, to understand what, is, what feature is important if we don't have this feature. If we talk about public data, I'm sure uh, there are a lot of errors uh, in, in many countries, not just in Serbia, but at least uh, we, we have to try to, 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 to improve the model, maybe with some different coefficient and uh, some kind of fitting with, uh, with this, uh, this uh, real data. Yeah, very good. And then um, this is a question from myself. Um, do you see, um, obviously timing is very, very much of the essence, not only in finding solutions, but quite clearly in testing and predicting, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that there's a possibility at some point it could become a machine learning or an AI conversation versus even vaccination? Or do you feel that these two areas of expertise could complement each other? Which do you think could be first? Okay. I, I, <laughs> I think uh, uh, vaccination, uh, of course, uh, will be final solution, I, I guess. But at least uh, 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 before that, we can use AI, of course, for this kind of prediction, uh, how particular patient will behave or how population will behave, will behave. But I'm sure for vaccine development also, we need AI because there are a lot of uh, trial and error experimental work. and. Uh, I think uh, experimental guys uh, uh, use a lot of time to improve this, to 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 make uh, you know to to make proof of concept and uh, uh, find the, the optimization and final solution for vaccine. So I'm sure AI can help a lot, at least to speed up this process of optimization uh, and help researchers who are doing this to reduce the number of experiments and to go much faster in the right direction. Excellent, great response. Actually very fascinating too. So um, yes, very good. And then thank you Marco for the question as well here. Um, does your work give you an idea about the accuracy of the COVID tests? I know you've partially covered that in an ad, but maybe you might have an extra comment about the accuracy of uh, your work in COVID tests. <laughs> Okay, for uh, you mean a PCR test, right? Standard. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, as I know, uh, its uh, accuracy is uh, very low, <laughs> actually. Uh, when you test once, it's 33%, but when you test two times, it's 19%. Uh, there is uh, some uh, theorem, uh, mathematical proof why is this, because if you have two times, 33% uh, probability uh, uh, of accuracy is 90 percent <laughs> so it's doubling uh well i i believe that uh, if you really have more testing uh the test is more accurate but only one one in, is not enough okay very good so uh unless there's any other questions i'd like to thank you very much ninad uh reactor of university thank of kraju jevak do I pronounce it correctly? Excuse, I didn't hear. Do I pronounce the university correctly? University ah, yes, yes, Kraguelas. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and a full professor of Faculty of Engineering and the head of bioengineering at the University of Kradjucevac. Excuse my bad pronunciation. Great, great. Um, thank you very much. Thank so, you. Um, thank everybody. Um,